Okay. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day, everyone. Welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 8th of April 2021. Uh, hope everything is uh, well with you and your loved ones. Uh, and Sebastian and myself are delighted to host you again this week uh, with another uh, geoscientific and geoenergetic uh, webinar. Uh, today we have the pleasure and honor to host Professor Tony uh, Kovsek from Stanford University. Uh, Tony joined the faculty uh, of School of Earth, actually in Stanford University in 96, as assistant professor and then associate professor in 2003, and then finally full professor in 2010. He served as the chair of the Energy Resources Engineering Department at Stanford University between 2012 and 18. And previously also, he served as the executive editor of the Society of Petroleum Engineers journal, uh, SPEJ, a very uh, well-known journal between 2009 and 12. Tony holds a Bachelor of Science and PhD degrees, uh, both in chemical engineering uh, from the University of Washington and University of California at Berkeley. Uh, the Bachelor of Science uh, was awarded in 89 and the PhD in 94, respectively. Uh, Tony and his research group develop and apply advanced imaging techniques and experimentation to understand complex multiphase flows of gas, water, and organic phases in natural and manufactured porous media with applications, uh, diverse applications in carbon storage and increased utilization of carbon dioxide for subsurface applications. His publications report on studies of secondary and enhanced recovery processes for oil fields in California and worldwide. To date, he has authored two books, roughly uh, 175 peer reviewed publications, as well as more than 125 SPE proceeding manuscripts. Uh, Tony has been honored with the SPE Lester Uren Award in 2015 for distinguished achievement in the technology of petroleum engineering and the distinguished achievement award for faculty from the SPE in 2006. Additionally, he has received the Stanford School of Earth Sciences Award for Excellence in Teaching and the SPE Western North America Region Technical Achievement Award in 2005 for contributions to oil recovery uh, in the Western region, I mean, California and Alaska. So I can't really do any justice to introduce him and his groundbreaking uh, work and the significant impact he has uh, uh, made in the scientific uh, and educational communities in the geoscience field in general. I hope this brief introduction gave a uh, especially our students, audience, uh, others know him very well, um, a, a kind of an image about his uh, work. Please do visit his Google Scholar page, uh, study his uh, very, very impactful uh, research uh, outcome. Uh, it's our pleasure and honor to host you, Tony, here. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation, being up 7 a.m. in California. Uh, and to the audience, please note, uh, Tony's lecture would last for about half an hour followed by questions and discussions. Like always, please do post your questions in the chat box. Sebastian will go through them after the lecture. Uh, do not wait till end of the webinar to post your questions. Please do post them as uh, uh, you find appropriate. They may trigger other questions by the audience as well. So without any uh, further ado, uh, Tony, the stage, uh, the screen bandwidth, all is yours. We are looking forward to hearing your lecture and thanks once more. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Hadi, for that uh, introduction. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah. As as you noted, it is seven a.m. in California, so uh, you may hear some noises of people having breakfast uh, behind me. Hopefully, it won't be too uh, too loud. I'm going to talk today about some really recent work that my group has been doing on um, imaging at the really fine scale, as well as uh, applying machine learning to try and really get the most that we can get out of, uh, out of our images. So here is what I'd like to do today, really four parts. Um, I'm gonna do, give a, a real sort of brief uh, introduction to my um, research. 
I'm going to talk about motivation for this, this problem that I'm describing. I'll give you some applications. Uh, the first is going to be uh, some tomographic imaging at the nanometer scale. And then uh, the second is going to be uh, generative uh, networks for uh, uh, basically image extension, if you want to call it that. And then we'll be done. And I'm going to watch the time because as a professor, I'm uh, actually now programmed to speak for 60 minutes because by teaching on Zoom, we, uh, we've been... Uh, you know, we extended class time from 50 minutes to 60 minutes. But I will, <laughs> I am going to watch the time. Uh, so my, my activities really fall into two big categories. The, the first is uh, uh, the, the so-called SUPRI program. This is an industrial affiliates program. And so that means, you know, companies. And, and the work here is really enhanced recovery. And our, uh, you know, our space is really low energy processes, right? So how do we... Uh, recover, um, f you know, fluids from the earth, recover oil from the earth and do that in a way with the smallest carbon footprint. Um, and how do we manage, you know, carbon from fossil fuels? Uh, the, the second is uh, a US DOE Energy Frontier Center called the Center for Mechanistic Control of uh, Unconventional Formations. And, and here, the, the, you know, the scientific challenge really is that uh, natural nanoporous geomaterials uh, are, are really extreme environments, and there's a, a lot that we don't know about them. And so there's sort of a, a dual payoff here. One is just, you know, the, advancing the science. Uh, and the other one is that we can, uh, again, reduce the impacts of um, production if we understand the system better and can be more, more efficient. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna kind of motivate the work that we're doing a little bit today, again, with some practical stuff. So this on the left is a picture of initial production, well, of production versus time in the Permian Basin. So different series of wells starting in, you know, the late 2000s uh, and kind of up to 2015. And so what you see is that the initial rates go up quite a bit due to, you know, improved uh, drilling and completion practices. But over, you know, the long time, so 24 months, you know, these wells decline and the long-term production rates are all pretty similar. Uh, so this contributes to actually quite poor recovery of gas. For instance, gas would be 25% recovery factor. Um, oil is even less. I've heard some people say that it's, you know, on average, maybe two, 3%, but the kind of the, the, the line is 50%. So we're really interested in gas uh, for a lot of reasons that I won't go into. Um, but uh, the, you know the the problem, or one of the problems here, is really kind of illustrated on the right. So this is data compiled by the U.S. Geological Survey, and this is for these different plays the average amount of water that it takes to complete a well. And you know you see that it's in the millions of gallons. And just to kind of put these numbers in perspective, this four million gallons is the average daily consumption of about 11,000 US families. And so in the in the US water reuse and water use is really uh, a really major uh, issue at the moment and and we would like to address this to reduce uh, to reduce impacts. Um, so on, on a little bit more on the you know the scientific side um, you know we have formations that are very deep, you know, thousands of meters. Uh, we have an interplay of physics and length scales. So this kind of bubble uh, on the upper right here <clears throat> is illustrating interaction of fluids with a pore wall. And there are, you know, uh, chemical species in this pore wall, sorry, in this pore fluid. Uh, this is perhaps at the angstrom scale. If we go to sort of the micron scale, this is an image of the fabric of uh, of shale with pyrite identified and and the matrix identified at sort of the millimeter scale um we still can see the fabric of um, of the shale there are micro fractures <clears throat> this in fact is a sample that's been reacted 
with um, with hydraulic fracturing fluid, and there's been some deposition in some of the, some of these microfractures. So there's a little bit of a rind on this. Um, at the slightly you know larger scale, there's the induced fractures uh, that are responsible for production at the at the well. And you know this is a multi physics process, so there is transport chemistry <clears throat> and mechanics acting as well. So there can be quite a dis you know quite a heterogeneous distribution of uh, of stress in the system due to production. <clears throat> so that's our you know that's our motivation, that's our challenge, and uh, you know the aspects that I'm really sort of looking at are this uh, you know how do we image the fa fabric? How do we know? Uh, what it looks like, and then how can we extend our extend our measurements? So uh, here is a you know kind of a summary of uh, a workflow that my group uh, uses. And so what we'll do is begin with like a core, and so this is actually quite a large sample, so two and a half centimeters uh, diameter by roughly nine centimeters long. And this image is an image of uh, a sample that's been saturated with carbon dioxide, and we could use other gases as well. So the colors you can think of as porosity. Um, this is a storage factor. And uh, the reason it's not exactly a porosity is that there is some adsorption, and so you're seeing uh, adsorbed as well as gas in the pore space. So red is more uh, CO2, and blue, dark blue would be no CO2. So this is a 3D image. We can take that image. We can rotate it. We can we can look at it. Uh, we can find a cross section like this that's interesting. So in this cross section, there are regions of the pore space where CO2 has never penetrated, and there are regions here in red where you know CO2 has has penetrated very well. So you see, even at this scale, um, the system is very heterogeneous. So we find a location like this. We actually cut the core. Um, <clears throat> and then we polish and uh, do some scanning electron microscopy. So this is a, uh, a whole cross-section mosaic, and this is a multi-scale image. So we can look at this uh, section here, uh, zoom in. And so here, this is uh, 300 nanometers on this scale bar. And this crack that you see is probably a crack due to um, cutting and preparing the system. Um, but otherwise, we see regions that are dark like this. So this is the kerogen. We see regions that are bright like this. So these are dense minerals. We can zoom in on this location and uh, see here is this piece of organic matter. Uh, here, this sort of what, what I would describe as fluffy is kind of characteristic of regions in uh, this, uh, this sample that are very um, accepting of gases, right? Sort of that fluffy nature uh, seems to be a you know, characteristic of, of good transport. There is kerogen in here. Uh, we can zoom in on a location like this using transmission electron microscopy. Uh, and so this is at 100 nanometer resolution. These are two nanometer pixels. The dark that you see is the uh, actually the pore space in the in the carriage and so kind of the, the next sort of you know the rest of the talk we're going to look at uh, some TEM images and what we can do with TEM and then we're also going to uh, look partially at uh, transmission x-ray microscopy images and so this is uh, nano CT right so this is computed tomography using x-rays but at the at the nanometer scale and this image uh, has you know the the minerals um, segmented all right that's what the, the different colors are so just to kind of continue um, we do uh, a sum uh, it's actually quite laborious uh, scanning transmission electron uh, microscopy and so you know you begin with a, a sample like this we would do um, some gallium ion milling um, so so this is called focused ion beam and you know do something like this so we would take this sample we would remove a bunch of material so make like a trench then make like a u-cut and then <clears throat> we can lift uh the sample out and then attach it to a you know basically a, a, a mount all right and that sample will look uh something like this 
So this is the sample that's been removed. And then we we have gone in and, and thinned down a region here and created a, a lamella of rock. So this is about eight microns by 20 microns by 100 nanometers, uh, 100 nanometers thick. So that, you know, that is then thin enough that we can uh, get an X-ray beam to go through that thin sample. And in 2D, the images would look, you know, something like this, right? So we can see the fabric. Here's some clay. Here's some fine grains. Here in these black or darker regions are um, our organic material. Then we can go and look at, say, a region like this kind of clearly. And this is the uh, image that you saw, well, similar to the image that you saw previously, but at slightly greater um, resolution. And again, the dark. Uh, are the pores, and this is surrounded by some quartz grains. And in this, uh, this is high angle dark field. So DF stands for dark field imaging, if you're an imaging person. So then um, the, the trick uh, here, if you will, uh, is to do the following. So this lamella um, gets rotated um, basically through 120 degrees. And we take uh, we take these images, and then this is actually suitable to do a tomographic uh, reconstruction. So there is some you know missing data, but uh, over this central piece, uh, we have a you know a field of view uh, where the voxel size is roughly a nanometer. So it's a nanometer by a nanometer by a nanometer. And on the bottom here is a kind of a reconstruction of this lamella with the, you know, the different materials identified, right? So green is the mineral matrix, uh, blue is the organic matter, and red is the porosity. So um, here at, uh, you know, greater kind of uh, resolution and greater uh, identification is the pore space. So in the, the lamella is here, you see its thickness sort of illustrated. Uh, this is the porosity that's been identified. So the blue is porosity that percolates or is connected across the sample. And then the gold color is porosity that's not connected. So about half the porosity is connected and half is, is not. Uh, at this region here, uh, at sort of greater magnification, uh, again, the same coloring, you see that most of the porosity that's connected are these sort of tubular or worm-like uh, pore spaces. And then things that are not connected really might be tubular or worm-like. And a lot of it is this sort of spherical or ellipsoidal uh, pores. So we can do a lot of things with this image. So standard sort of uh, image analysis. Uh, here on the bottom is a plot of the frequency or the counts versus the pore size, right? So there are a lot of very small pores, you know, in the nanometer range, um, but the pores that are connected are primarily, you know, larger with a, a predominance in sort of a 20 nanometer or, or greater um, sort of range. So th in fact, these sort of larger pores, if you want to consider something that's 20 nanometers being large or really what's responsible for the, the, the transport in this, in this sample. So one thing that we can do with these images uh, are to, to actually do computations on the, on the images. So we've done this with uh, basically both like Stokes, solving the Stokes equation directly as well as doing uh, lattice Boltzmann simulations. These are actually simulations using uh, using Stokes flow. And, you know, this is an image of over time, how methane invades the sample until we get to sort of a steady state flow, which you see rotating here. This illustrates the pore space uh, and the fluids moving through the, through the pore space. So from this kind of a simulation, we can calculate the apparent permeability and it's three uh, nano Darcy's, which is quite in range for, uh, you know, for the matrix of a, of a sample like this. Okay, so just kind of a quick summary. Um, we can uh, identify both the intra-organic uh, matter, so between the organic matter, as well as uh, within the organic matter. 
uh, the pore sizes, we can characterize the porosity, we can characterize the shape and the nature of the pores, uh, as well as any, any anisotropy. All right, so with that, I'm gonna uh, transition a bit, still talk about images, and I'm gonna, gonna transition into really what we've been trying to do lately with uh, machine learning to extend, uh, to extend images. So uh, one, well, let me start here. Uh, you know, this is actually one of the problems of, you know, speaking inside of a, you know, a box this big. I can't really wave my hands very well, but with imaging, there, there are a couple of really big trade-offs at, at this fine scale. Um, what we would like to do is non-destructive imaging. So things like computed tomography and NMR, um, because they are non-destructive and they're inherently 3D. Um, but the problem is, uh, is that, especially with CT, as you're gonna see, is that they have sort of lesser contrast. So same spatial resolution, but lesser contrast. Uh, then there are the destructive methods like scanning electron microscopy, which have, you could have greater resolution and have greater contrast, but they are, you know, the sample is, the sample is gone. So we have a, a kind of a workflow illustrated here on the bottom. So image acquisition, kind of what I've just been talking about with, with TEM. Uh, we do a lot of uh, pre-processing. Uh, we do some image augmentation, uh, say perhaps to enhance contrast. Uh, and then we do uh, machine learning, and then there's a, a fair amount of post-processing um, at, at, at the end. So I'm going to show you um, what we've been doing with um, generative adversarial networks. And I, I'm actually going to start with, with this um, multimodal challenge slide um, because uh, there's really a lot to do in, in just sort of getting images all kind of uh, together. So I'll, I'll describe how these were acquired in a moment, but we have uh, nano CT, uh, again, transmission X-ray microscopy images. We have uh, SEM images, nominally at the same location in a sample, but actually uh, there are different thicknesses to these and actually getting all of the image stacks aligned um, is, is, a, is a big problem. So sometimes even these FIB SEM stacks, uh, the distance between the slices varies, uh, the shape of the stack varies. This is showing something, you know, that's nice and rectangular or conical, but it can it can vary a lot. So there's a big big problem just in getting everything sort of uh, aligned. So where this data set comes from is sort of illustrated here. So we have a, a, a shale sample. Uh, it's been thinned down to about 30 micron diameter cylinder. Uh, and that's a good size for uh, nano CT. So here is a reconstruction. You can see some dense material. Uh, this is probably like pyrite and then uh, less dense material. So like carrageen. So for the same sample, uh, we have acquired SEM images. So like illustrated here and, and basically we take an image, we then remove some material and take another image. So these are nominally the same resolution. So 30 nanometers uh, voxel size. And then for the SEM, it's roughly 30 nanometers and the, the depth of penetration is uh, you know, a, few, a few nanometers. So uh, you know, that's the data set. And we're hoping by you know, doing this destructively once that we can then um, apply, uh, you know, our machine learning algorithm and have, you know, greater image contrast in the rest of this sample. So here is the kind of the implementation. So we are using a generative adversarial network approach. So there are uh, kind of two kind of aspects to this, right? So uh, this is a TXM image. This is input. This is a predicted image, predicted by some sort of a, a network. And you can see already what we're hoping to do, right? So this, there's enhanced image contrast in this image. So the other thing that happens in a, in a GAN is that the, uh, the system, the discriminator is fed uh, a, a bunch of images that are paired 
and then the discriminator tries to decide whether or not uh, you know these are real pairs or not. So uh, you know this discriminator keeps trying to get fooled, and then progressively over time, uh, it learns better and better. Uh, you know what real image pairs um, sort of sort of look like. Okay, and in the end when it's trained right, then we can do this transformation uh, quite accurately. So continuing. Um, this uh, is kind of the first use case of, of GANs on rock images. So here is a TXM uh, image uh, input. And you can see that there is you know, regions of you know, contrast here, but not very, uh, not very sharp. This at the same location is the SEM image. So this is the ground truth. Uh, these are the outputs from you know, different uh, networks. What seem to work best are these ResNet networks, and and you can see this is the peak signal to noise on the bottom. So in fact, uh, these ResNet uh, have the best peak signal to noise. And going back, you know, we can we can look at uh, you know sort of do do the I norm, right? So this high density uh, mineral is reproduced pretty well. These low density images, which are probably kerogen as well as some cracks, also, also reappear. So it's not perfect, right? But it's much better than this, this TXM image. And then you know, we can do things like uh, you know, uh, go through our TXM stack, apply this, um, have uh, an image with greater resolution, and then do a 3D reconstruction with, uh, with greater, uh, greater resolution. So um, I'm going to now switch and uh, tell you about uh, another uh, sort of application. So uh, again, it's the same, you know, the same thing is that you know, images are really laborious to acquire. And what we would then like to do is really with the images that we have, like you know, those images that I just showed you where we've enhanced the uh, contrast, we would then like to basically use those images to uh, find other images that are consistent with the base image so that we can you know do things like uh, look at uh, uncertainty and and quantify you know how images could uh, how the real rock could vary um, spatially so um, these are some results from a, a, a generative flow model uh, I won't go into really the the details on the less on the left is the uh, the training loss, and you can see this is versus, you know, many thousand iterations. So on the right, uh, you see what the real data set looks like. And then these different columns from A to E are different periods in the training process. So you can see by, um, you know, roughly 30,000 uh, iterations, we're starting to get, you know, quite a sharp uh, image and something that actually really looks like the rock pore space. And I should have told you that I, I've switched rocks on you. This is a this is a Bentheimer um, sandstone because it's it's just a lot easier to work with. We've done this on shale, but I'm not going to show you the shale results just because um, you know really for issues of time. And so uh, we have now uh, those images. One of the really nice things that we can do with a generative flow model is, in fact, reconstruct 3D volumes, and that's uh, on the on the bottom. So in the um, in the process of generative flow models, uh, you can work in latent space. So in the in the latent space of the model, linear combinations of the two images are, in fact. Uh, interpolations in in image space. So in this stack of images in the middle, the base images are on the either end, and in between are interpolated uh, images. And so this gives us a way of constructing three D volumes consistent with the original uh, the original images. And if I can, I probably can't get this to go because I'm in the laser pointer, so I won't. But um, you get a sense of, you know, that this is constructing pore space in black uh, and grains in, in gray. Uh, and so this is a nice property of these generative flow models. 
Um, okay, okay, we'll start. There you go. You can see the you know how the pore space varies as we move through uh, through an image stack, and it, you know it generates some nice continuity amongst the pore space, which again is is dark. So what we can do with these uh, images are a number of things. We can look at their characteristics. Uh, so we, you know, these box and whisker plots are, are original, are from the, you know, the original data set, if you will, uh, of this uh, sandstone, and then synthetic are our reconstructions, right? So uh, you can see porosity. We're, you know, we're not exactly on, but we are within, you know, the the range of the expectation. Uh, this is the surface area. Uh, the mean breadth is really a measure of the curvature of the grains. And so what this is kind of saying is that the details of the roughness of the grain uh, are not exactly matching the original. But, you know, I, again, this is pretty, uh, pretty close. See, this is a 10 to the minus 3 scale. These are 10 to the minus 2. The Euler characteristic is a measure of the connectivity. And again, we don't have the same range in our synthetic image, but we are, you know, in the same uh, sort of ballpark, um, you know, measurement. So according to, you know, these measures, uh, you know, we have reconstructed uh, a sandstone uh, pore network. And then we can do things like look at the pore size distribution. So red is synthetic, black is original. Uh, this agrees pretty well. We can do calculations of uh, permeability directly on uh, the image stack. And that's what you see here. What's a And this is for uh, both uh, basically an open foam, which is synthetic, uh, Navier Stokes, actually the, 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 uh, uh, Open foam would be a Stokes calculation, as well as uh, LBM. So it's a typical kind of a scatter plot that you might expect. Uh, there are some interesting things like the Lattice Boltzmann method results all kind of fall on this cloud here, and you know they're a bit above uh, what we would get from the open foam calculation. So we're still trying to kind of understand. Uh, what's going on there. But again, everything is sort of uh, in range here and we have a cloud of data like we would expect. And there's a trend uh, like we would expect of increasing permeability uh, with increasing porosity. So um, that's kind of it. That gets me to the end, right? So uh, this is a, you know, this top-down imaging workflow we find to be very uh, powerful to locate uh, regions within inside really macroscopically sized samples to find regions where we really want to go in and look at things at, uh, at quite fine uh, detail. We're quite enthusiastic about uh, generative networks for uh, image processing uh, and for really extending the image data sets that we have. So with that, I'm going to conclude with this slide. This is a picture of my research group from uh, happier times when uh, we weren't in lockdown. Uh, and this is from the courtyard of the, the building where we, uh, where we uh, you know, do all of our work. And uh, this, the people in blue, uh, Bolivia, Laura, Kelly, and Tim, this is really uh, the work that I've shown you is really their work. So that's the end of what I had to say. And um, I'll wait for instructions if I should quit out yeah. of PowerPoint. Sure. Thank you very much, Tony, for this very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, we hope that very soon we get updated uh, version of this photo as well so as the team gets back to the lab and i believe everybody that was watching this webinar is also wishing to hold again a group photo uh, please uh, folks work out and and make sure you stay on shape and and well even though you work from home so i see a lot of questions already posted i'm gonna just unshare your uh, presentation so that most probably you would be able to see us uh, Sebastian, the stage is yours, please. Yes, thank you very much, Tony, for a great talk. Um, there are plenty, plenty of questions coming in. So I perhaps start with um, the first one here, something very general from Seed. I bring this up. Seed um, says, thank you. I would appreciate if you could tell us a little bit more about Seagun. Okay, so, uh, you know, in, in, in fact, what we have tried to do is to basically as much as we can use things off the shelf 
uh, not uh, you know not rewrite things. Uh, so we, in fact, used the algorithm from uh, uh, Isola, I believe is how it's pronounced. So it's the picks to picks algorithm. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that's something that's downloadable and uh, and and shareable. And um, in the references, so th th that work is published in Computers and Geosciences. Um, so you can refer to that, and and uh, we've shared our, you know, our, you know, our implementation of the picks to picks algorithm uh, there. But again, you know, the way that it really, it's a little bit, you know, sort of laborious, and 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 you're not, you know, that's one of the things with the CGANs, is that uh, you know the way it's trained is that the, the you know the discriminator. Uh, you're always trying to fool it, right? So you're feeding it images that are paired and some that are not paired, and it has to figure out if they're, you know, they're real, uh, you know, real pairs or not. Um, so, you know, in the end, uh, you have to, you know, really sort of look at your results and and kind of understand what it is that you've got and if it kind of makes, you know, makes sense or not. Um, but for us, the real issue was really not in the discriminator, but in the how do you actually do the image transformation, right? So we tried a, a bunch of different uh, networks mm -hmm. there, and really the, the ResNet networks ended up working the best for that image translation. Mm -hmm. So I hope you know that's you know in, in short, I would say that's a, a quick summary of of CGANs. Thank you. You referred to your publication, and just to pick up another question, see it has is the code going to be available online, um, or do you need to? Is it sort of open source code your implementation, or do you need to reprogram it yourself if you want to play around with this? Yeah. So it's on what we yeah our implementation there. It's on GitHub, so it's okay. It's, it's downloadable. Yeah. yeah. So getting a bit more technical, Vasily, and I think that is Vasily um, from Harold Watt University. Um, is wondering, it seems that the same TXM image is fed to both generate and discriminator. Is that right? If you following your CGAN um, schematic slide. Yeah, that's right. So there is a, you know, there's a step where we, where we, um, we basically improve the contrast in the image, right? So that's one part of it. And then there's another part where uh, paired images are fed to the, you know, are fed to the discriminator. And so what we, you know, we have actually, in terms of pixels, we have actually quite a large image, right? So we subsample the, you know, once we pair the cross sections, we then subsample the paired images uh, to, to create a lot of paired images to feed to the discriminator, right? So one cross section uh, can provide quite a number of, of paired images for the discriminator. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Florian has a question, and so it's a two-part question. He asks, with respect to the reconstruction of resolution, have you looked into situations with different plausible high-resolution images map onto the same coarse resolution, and how bad does it get? In other words, could the reconstructed model be worse than the coarse resolution image? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, uh, and we haven't uh, really addressed that yet. We are trying. To do something similar at the moment um, with uh, clinical computed tomography and um, micro CT, um, but that yeah that is a that is a distinct possibility, right? That you can be going in the wrong direction, and that that is also a big question that we have is how kind of uh, unique, if you will, are these um, you know are these uh, transformations. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say though, in the um, you know there, there yeah there there's there's you know a number of issues, but maybe I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, that's a great question, and that's something that we're we are asking ourselves that question. You know, like, how unique uh, you know are these? And you know if you uh, took the same you know base uh, low resolution image and and just did it a bunch of times, how you know how how what's the variability in the you know in the high contrast image that you get back? And staying on sort of the, the technical side um, for yet another question from um, around the technical side again from Vasily, um, how would you explain the limit, limited capacity in reconstructing the larger pores at the high end? I think it means probably the large end. Yeah, I, that's, that's another great question. Um, so this is speculation. Um, 
so I, I don't know this for sure, but this is just speculation. So one of the uh, issues that we have, right, is what is the correct resolution in terms of pixels, right, mm -hmm. to, f to feed in. And so we've been going pro progressively larger and larger, right? So we started by, you know, images that were 64 by 64, and now we're doing 256 by 256. Um, and so, you know, as the image is larger, right? So it's the same pixel size, if you will, but we're taking more pixels. Um, so that, that's one of the, the, you know, the things that we're looking at in terms of the reconstruction is what, you know, the base image, just size, how does that, uh, how does that affect? But yeah, as, as you get larger images, uh, it takes longer and longer to, you know, to train the model, right? So that at some point there's a, uh, a limited patience, let's just say, uh, that people have to uh, see if algorithms are working. But there's a finite time to PhD students so if the simulation. <laughs> yeah. One simulation should be less um, in duration than the time it takes to finish your PhD. Yeah, exactly. Um, staying a little bit on this topic, so Leila asked, with respect to the multi-scale nature of the system, is it nice to describe a wonder um, whether we should combine different images to characterize better, like computer tomography, micro CT, nano CT? Yeah, as I, as I sort of mentioned that, that is something that we're trying to do right now is, is to combine these, you know, these different scale tomographic images um, to, you know, to get some degree of super resolution. Um, so you know, ideally what we really would like to do is, uh, you know, kind of take tomographic images at roughly the 100 micron voxel size. And, and why is that? Because those are fast, right? You can you can acquire those images quite quickly. Like you could that core that I showed can be scanned, you know, in the order of a minute or so. Um, but then to apply, you know, some super resolution to try and you know resolve finer and finer features. Um, you know, uh, the the literature says maybe a factor of four is quite doable. That's what they do in the medical imaging. Uh, we are. Current, so we're trying to do that factor of four. Our goal is actually a factor of eight improvement in in spatial resolution. Um, why eight? Because that's just not just, but th that that's the images that we have actually have a difference of a factor of eight. So we'd like to be able to basically extract all the information from the high resolution image, uh, and then and then and then basically apply it in the you know the lower resolution image. Staying on so the, the image resolution, and let me start slightly different here. Um, first of the comments, Mohsen said, thank you for the interesting talk. Nine years ago, when I started my research, a paper from your group about solar generated steam was the oh. first paper ever that I studied for research related purposes. So um, there's clearly someone you've inspired to, to continue doing research, Tony. So Mohsen's question is, um, would it enhance image analysis to use additional imaging modalities at different spatial resolutions? For instance, TM at the nano scale for information about pore features. So a similar question to what Leila has asked. Yeah, the the answer is is yes, but you know the the devil is really in the details. Um, you know, as I sort of tried to describe, you know, a, a little bit. Um, Getting getting images or getting things aligned spatially, you know, knowing where you are, like image registration, um, there are some pretty significant challenges, right? And as you use different imaging modalities, uh, you have different, sh you know, e even just shapes, like really, you know, a computed tomography, right? We talk about voxels, uh, they're really more like spheres, right? And then you stack all these spheres up and knock things off. Um, so getting everything you know lined up is is really part of the challenge. But yeah, different different imaging modalities, and we have actually asked ourselves that same question uh, about TEM that came up, right? Is so you know we can uh, at sort of coarser scale we can image where the carrageen is. How can we then imprint into the carrageen the poor network that we measure with with TEM? Um, so that, you know those, those those are definitely you know, interesting questions. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe somebody out there is going to figure out how to do, do that. Um, but it, but it, that would be, you know, that would be our ultimate goal. Cause then we could truly do like a multi-scale, you know, simulation, even just with LBM, right. Cause it could handle 
the the you know the larger pore space and they can handle the flow through the through the um you know through the organic matter um before we go to some of the questions around lbm um marina Prima has a question for that goes in completely the opposite end of the scale so she says thank you for the inspiring talk I wonder what, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge in upscaling your imaging technique on the meter, even kilometer scale? Is that possible? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, there are a whole. But the biggest challenge, okay, is I think is probably is just a sampling problem, right? So, um, you know, we see things at very fine scale. Do they actually at that you know meter kilometer scale? Do they really you know do they matter, right? So. At that larger scale, do they, in some sense, survive? Right, that they have some impact at the at the larger scale. So I think you know the the big issue is really a sampling question, right? That um, you know what are we of the larger scale features? You know what are we what are we missing? Um, and you know are there are there larger scale correlations that we're not you know that we're not measuring? Thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, so Yuang. As a question, hi Tony. Thank you for the great talk. Have you considered absorption behavior in the transport simulation using LBM? Uh, the answer is Yu Hong. You should do that. Um, I know Yu Hong. Yeah. <laughs> so in fact, when I mentioned LBM, we're, we're, we're you know the LBM is Yu Hong's code that he created at the University of Wyoming. So uh, uh, when I keep saying he's, that, he's we've our tried postdoc to do now, it. Tony. He's in Delft, so I, I will remind him. About. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yuang, you need to be careful what questions you ask. Exactly. That's a work to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm not uh, surprised now Tony has the best teacher award of a Stafford, so this is the best answer you could give. <laughs> <laughs> but but Yuang brings up a good point. There, you know, there there uh, you know there's there's no I would say perfect really simulation code for um you know for these fine scale things right and there's you know there's different attributes that are are are, are better or, or not better actually i should be careful the the lbm that i showed at the very end was not yu hong's code um it was actually it was a commercial code um but when earlier in the tem part when i was mentioning with the you know the stem reconstruction when i said we can use basically a stokes simulator or we can use lbm that's where we've applied uh, Yu Hong's code, but in the the later stuff with the sandstone, we used a commercial um, LBM code. But uh, where I was sort of going is that you know the nice thing about uh, LBM is really you can build in a lot of physics. You know, again, it's not easy, um, but you can really build in a lot of build in a lot of physics, and that it's a nice thing about that that sort of computational platform, if you will. Staying on the topic of dynamics, and then we come back to sort of some imaging and, and um, the um, machine learning side. So Leila had a question, says, um, thank you for the inspiring talk. Can we image gas liquid flow systematically, system, image a gas liquid flow system dynamically? If yes, in what time frames can we take images with a nano CT? Um, so we can, yeah. This is this is a question of resolution and and time frames. So I am not at sort of this thirty nanometer resolution. I am not familiar with any nano CT that has uh, really fast acquisition time. So we did our images that I showed. Uh, we we did those up at the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, right? So in the nano CT, it's using synchrotron X-ray radiation. Uh, so that's bright and it's fairly intense, uh, but you know, still those images take a few hours to acquire. Yeah. Uh, I'm not as sure of any, you know, nano CT that would have, you know, like, you know, that you could, you know, image on the, you know, time frame of seconds, which is what you would need to really, capture dynamics at that fine scale but at the you know at the larger scale like a clinical ct yeah definitely we can image gas liquid flows and and we've done that and in shales um you could even do some really interesting things like uh, image dynamic gas flow right so you you know you have two gases and you choose one that has uh really good x-ray absorption properties uh, and then you can see displacement, you can see gas-gas displacement, or you can see 
uh, you can even see diffusion uh, occurring. So um, yeah, the, the question there really is what, at what scale do you want to, do you want to resolve things? And if anybody knows of a nano CT with, uh, you know, tens of seconds to do a, you know, a volumetric measure, please let me know. Cause I don't know of one. <laughs> we do have a question that was emailed to me. So I put it in under the geoscience GN in a webinar um, council. This is from Zeon who is listening to your talk, but, um, don't think has a Google account to post the question. So um, he says, thank you, great talk. It seems that the GAN reconstructed models have double worse connectivity in terms of the order number, which means more pores are disconnected. Can you please explain what could, and the question continues, could be the reason such a small pores that are not revealed in the model or others? Yeah, and so, so I also mentioned like the, the you know, the curvature or the roughness that we're getting is not exactly uh when the flow model is not exactly what we uh, are expecting I, I i don't know you know this is a very much like work in progress so we're, we're trying to figure out why you know some things seem to work very well and some things you know don't seem to work very well but you know we are really encouraged because um you know like those you know, the Euler characteristic, right, or the connectivity, um, you know, we're pretty, you know, we're pretty close, right, uh, in terms of the the range that, you know, in the real sample, uh, we're within the range. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty enthusiastic about this. But I don't know, it's, I, I, I it would be just, it would be pure speculation on my part. Mm -hmm. So Sayed had a lot of technical questions around um, Segan, and you've referred to your paper, but I'm just going to pull out um, one question maybe of, of broad interest. So I did not notice any noise input into the generator. Was there any? If not, why not use, why not only use a generator, say UNET? Um, <clears throat> so, um noise so yeah there isn't a specific noise input but the discriminator as i said is is you know it, it does we do try to fool it if you will right so we try to deceive it um and and that's the value of the adversarial network right so mm -hmm. one of the networks is trying to you know basically do the image translation and the other network is trying to you know continually fool the system uh, into you know into choosing wrong images, so that's the that's the value of of that approach, uh, and you wouldn't get that if you just used like one of the um, you know the the ResNet um, networks just to do the to do the translation. I think we have one final question, um, and that goes back to the imaging. So Vijita um, says, thank you for the nice talk. Is it possible to increase information micro CT based on learnings from destructive imaging techniques? It's a long shot, but um, it could be still great if achieved. Um, so, so, you know, we, you know, so this, this workflow where we did the TXM or the nano CT and uh, and the SEM, you could do that. You could repeat that um, using micro CT and uh, and SEM if there was some. You know, if you thought there was some value in in doing that uh, on say a you know a a sandstone sample. Yeah, you could you could definitely re repeat that. Um, the nice thing you know about like like the sandstone that I was showing you right is that the, the you know the micro CT really does have pretty good you know mm -hmm. image resolution right, so you can get a lot of the details uh, from that. But if, you know, for some reason, if you wanted to, you know, really get better details about like the roughness of grains or grain contacts, um, you could apply that. You could apply the same idea that way. Um, I think there are no further questions from, from the audience. There are lots of comments from Masali, from Aaron, um, Sid and others, thanking you for taking the time to answer. Maybe I can sneak in um, a quick question for myself. So one area that I've been quite interested in is of how we combine microprosty and macroprosty in carbonoids. So anything that's below whatever favorite um, definition you use, below sort of a micron size, you have two very different length scales. So with the approach that you presented, do you see any opportunities, any possible to tackle that challenge of 
combining to very separate scales in in the pore size distribution. Yeah, well, I mean, if if it was possible to sort of, uh, you know, in a way, image directly uh, all of the, the different porosities, um, mm. which may be possible in a carbonate, right? Because the micro porosity is perhaps all visible in an SEM. Yeah, uh, you you could you could apply this same you know kind of approach uh, that we're we're you know we've talked about uh, and then you know use the image directly to construct uh, you know, use the SEM image uh, in a way directly to construct a, a 3D volume right so from the S FIB SEM you know you could have a you know have a base set of images and then you could make you know a set of images consistent with them. Um, so I think if you, I think that would be a possibility. Um, there's also, you know, the, the same idea that I was talking about with, you know, where we have the, you know, the organic matter or the carrageen uh, and the TEM and then trying to imprint, you know, the, the, you know, the STEM images into that, uh, that, that would also be, a, you know, a way to, to do that, right? So you'd identify sort of the macro porosity and then identify the you know have some separate characterization of the micro porosity and then you know knit them together in some way that's consistent mm. but again that's sort of you know that's research that's a bit out there yeah <laughs> um stefan berg came in with sort of a two-part question so i'm going to read them out so um stefan says even with super resolution you can maximum gain a factor of two to four in terms of the dynamic range. However, many rocks have many orders of dynamic range in terms of relevant feature sizes. Wouldn't that bring in grid, any gridded model very quickly to its limits? And if yes, what alternative representation of rock structure would you propose? Yeah, so th this, is a, this is a great um, observation. So, yeah, th and, and in these shale materials, this is one of the interesting, you know, factors about them right is that they have you know basically any length scale that you look at they have some feature right and what's what's the important feature um and so we have sort of been in a way if you will satisfied with you know we do characterization at a particular length scale right and then we kind of ask ourselves like you know how would the, you know how does some fluid flow through that uh through that length scale. And then it is the question of how do you sort of knit everything um, together? Uh, ha you know, having said that, um, we are looking pretty strongly at dual porosity or dual continuum formulations um, because that's a natural way of handling the different sort of progression of, of length scales. Uh, and it's a way of, you know, describing something at, at core scale, right? So that you mm -hmm. um, kind of characterize the different, you know, the different length scales. So I don't have a great answer, but, you know, that's been our approach, right? And, and we're moving sort of progressively towards dual continuum um, mm -hmm. formulations. Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you for great talk. Thank you for answering Thanks. all the questions patiently and in great detail. And um, thank you to our audience for having a lot of insightful and interesting, challenging questions. So with that, Hadi, over to you yeah, again. Thanks. thanks very much, everyone. Great to see all these friends uh, asking questions. Uh, hi to everyone, Stefan, Maren, uh, Johan, everybody. Uh, so I'd like to also take the chance to announce our next week's speaker is Professor Tat Patsek from KAUST. Uh, and Pat is uh, traveling, so we try to get a hold of him and ask for the title of his talk. So we hope to post the flyer as soon as possible. And uh, we will then uh, post it through our uh, LinkedIn and Twitter account. So until next week, the same time, stay happy, healthy, and tuned into this channel. And we wish you all a very a good week ahead. Thanks very much, Tony. It was uh, a pleasure to host you here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Too. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.